Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of Trevor Joseph Hardy. Trevor was born on the 11th of June 1945 in Newton Heath, an area approximately three miles north of Manchester city centre in England. He had two older siblings and a younger brother, Colin, who was born when he was eight years old. Trevor and his siblings grew up on Stanley Street in Newton Heath, a close-knit working-class community that had been hit hard by the economic downturn at the time. From a very young age, Trevor had been getting into trouble. He soon developed a reputation within the area for shoplifting and petty theft before moving on to breaking into houses, including houses of family friends. As he moved into his teenage years, his behaviour became increasingly violent and his parents struggled to cope with his temper and criminal tendencies. It is also believed that he had started to kill and maim animals during this time. Trevor was sent to various residential reform schools and youth detention centres, but continuously ran away from them. At just 15 years of age, it is believed that he was sent to Strangeways High Security Men's Prison and understood to be the youngest person who was ever imprisoned there. Upon his release from Strangeways, his violent and criminal behaviour continued. Attacks were often unprovoked and pub brawls were the norm. He relished his reputation as a hard man who needed to be feared. In 1972, after an argument over drinks escalated, Trevor attacked a man with a pickaxe. He was arrested and sentenced to five years in prison. After serving just over three years of his sentence, he was released on parole on the 18th of November 1974. Trevor had spent his time in prison plotting revenge on those he believed had done wrong by him. As he returned back to Manchester, he had his mind set on killing two people. The first was his ex-friend Stanley O'Brien, who Trevor suspected had double-crossed him. The second was a 14-year-old girl by the name of Beverly Driver. Beverly and Trevor had been friends prior to his incarceration. The nature of their friendship is not known. For a while she had written to him whilst he was in prison, However, when her family had found out about this, they insisted she stopped having any contact with this dangerous man. Trevor felt betrayed by this young girl. When Trevor returned to his parents' house in Brentner Road, Moston, he was furious that his plans for revenge had been ruined. Stanley O'Brien had died whilst Trevor was in prison. However, he still had one target left. On the 31st of December 1974, he went to Beverly's house, but she was not at home. In temper, he threw an axe through her window before spotting a young girl walking down the street. Assuming that this was Beverly, he followed her, called out, and when the girl turned, Trevor stabbed her. This was not Beverly. It was a 15-year-old girl by the name of Janet Leslie Stewart, who was walking to meet her boyfriend. Janet was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Trevor buried Janet's body in a shallow grave in Newton Heath. During the weeks that followed Janet's murder, Trevor would return to this shallow grave and cut up Janet's body. He then reburied her body parts in other locations. He removed a ring that Janet had been wearing at the time of her murder and gave this to another girl as a gift. Janet's disappearance was treated as a missing person by the police, who assumed that she had most likely run away. Little is known as to what Trevor was doing in the six months following Janet's murder, but on the 19th of July 1975, he struck again. 18-year-old Wanda Scala worked as a part-time barmaid in the Light Bound Hotel in Moston. This was north of Manchester. As Wanda has Polish heritage, it's possible her name is pronounced Wanda, but I will refer to her as Wanda during this case. She was well known and well liked in the local community. On the evening of the 19th, Wanda had worked some extra hours at the end of her shift to help out at a party. As she walked home, Trevor attacked and killed her. 
He then buried her body under a mound of loose earth and cardboard on a building site just a short distance from Wanda's home. The following morning, Wanda's body was found by a passerby. She had been sexually assaulted and her body had been mutilated. The level of violence inflicted upon this young woman shocked all of those involved in the case. Wanda's murder brought fear to the community and the police asked for help from the public with any information that could assist them. This also included the location of Wanda's handbag, clothes and one of her shoes, items which Trevor had decided to keep. Two local women reported hearing a man shouting and a woman crying at about 2.30am on the morning of the 20th of July and then a 46-year-old taxi driver by the name of Norris Hoyle came forward with some additional information. Norris told the police that he had picked up a fare at Manchester Piccadilly train station and was driving towards Moston around the time of the murder. As he was driving, he saw a couple fighting. The man had his left hand over the woman's mouth and had something in his right hand. It appeared that the man was about to hit the woman. The taxi driver provided a description of the man. Around 5 foot 9 inches tall, slim build, with dark hair. The police continued to investigate and also decided to reopen a case from April 1971 which had many similarities. 17 year old Dorothy Layden had been sexually attacked and beaten to death when walking home and her body had been dumped behind a pub in Collyhurst which was about three miles away from Moston. The police felt that the same man may have been responsible for both of these murders. A week after Wanda's murder, the police recreated Wanda's final steps using a policewoman wearing similar clothing. They set up roadblocks nearby in the hope that someone had seen something that would help them in the search for the killer. Meanwhile, Trevor had called his younger brother, Colin, and asked him to meet in the local pub. Colin, who had spent years distancing himself from his violent older brother, was reluctant to see him. This reluctance, however, turned to shock as Trevor casually told Colin that he was the one who had committed Wanda's murder. This fact was confirmed by Trevor's girlfriend at the time, 42-year-old Sheila Farrow. The following morning, Colin went to the police and told them of his brother's confession. Shortly afterwards, Trevor was arrested and taken into custody. However, Sheila gave Trevor a false alibi for the night of the murder. It is also believed that she smuggled a file to Trevor whilst he was in custody, which enabled Trevor to file his teeth so that the imprints would not match the bite marks found on Wanda's body. Much to Colin's horror and fear, Trevor was released without charge soon afterwards. The following year, on the 9th of March 1976, Trevor was attempting to break into a high street department store when he was disturbed by one of their employees, 17-year-old Sharon Mossoff. Trevor attacked and killed Sharon before dumping her naked, mutilated body into the Rochdale Canal in Failsworth. Overnight the canal had frozen and the following morning a worker at a nearby dairy found Sharon's body frozen into the ice. Many of the injuries inflicted on Sharon were the same as those found on Wanda's body the previous year. As the search for the killer continued, over 23,000 people were stopped and searched, but it would take another attack to give the police the break in the case which they were searching for. A man had grabbed a 21-year-old woman by the name of Christian Campbell in a toilet in a local pub. After being interrupted, the man fled and the girl survived with minimal injuries. However, there were many witnesses who recognised the man as being Trevor Hardy. With the police closing in on Trevor, he went on the run and managed to evade capture by living in quarries, railway tunnels and canal banks. The police visited his now ex-girlfriend Sheila who admitted that she had given Trevor a false alibi for the night of Wanda's murder. The police then decided to put Sheila under surveillance in the hope that Trevor would make contact with her. 
After evading capture for several months, Trevor contacted Sheila and was arrested in July 1976. Trevor eventually made a 40-page confession detailing Wanda and Sharon's murders and, in a shock to the investigating officers, also confessed to the murder of Janet. He was never charged with the 1971 murder of Dorothy and years later, DNA evidence determined that he was not responsible for this crime. The case went to trial early in 1977 and Trevor pleaded not guilty to murder but guilty of manslaughter due to diminished responsibility. He was, however, found guilty of murder and was sentenced to three life sentences at Manchester Crown Court on the 2nd of May 1977. He would serve a minimum term of 30 years at Wakefield Prison in Yorkshire. During his time in prison, Trevor refused to take responsibility for the murders and never showed any remorse. He even went so far as to send a letter to Sharon's parents, in which he blamed his parents and upbringing for Sharon's death. It was later confirmed that Trevor was one of a number of prisoners who had been issued with a whole life tariff, meaning that there was no possibility that he would ever be released on parole. In September 2012, 67-year-old Trevor had a heart attack and collapsed in his cell at Wakefield Prison. He died in hospital two days later on the 25th of September 2012. He had spent over 35 years in prison and became one of the longest serving prisoners in England and Wales alongside the likes of Robert Maudsley, Patrick Mackay, Charles Bronson and Peter Sutcliffe. Despite the horrific nature of Trevor's crimes, his name is relatively unknown when compared to other serial killers. It is believed that due to his crimes overlapping with the start of the Reign of Terror brought about by the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, he failed to obtain the notoriety that he undoubtedly would have welcomed. This case was suggested by Mike Up, so thanks Mike Up for recommending that case. Please remember to add any comments down below. As always, I'll be interested in reading them. Thanks once again for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. In 1904, Henry Royce and Charles Rolls met for a lunchtime meeting at the Midland Hotel in Manchester. By the end of their meal, Rolls-Royce was formed. Goodbye.